about stealing from God this morning. Stealing from God. This is the third part of this series, and we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. I'll be reading from the NIV this morning. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. Uh, Before I begin, let me say it this way. Uh, There was an article printed in the London Observer, and it was a story that went something like this. There was this piano in England that sat in the corner of this person's, you know, kind of cottage, and there were these mice that lived inside that piano all the days of their life, if you will, and generation after generation, and uh, they heard the music and the beautiful harmonies and the courting that happened on the piano, and it kind of gave them the imagination that there was this sort of unseen player out there somewhere playing these beautiful harmonies, and yet they couldn't figure out who he was. They just knew that he existed, if you will, playing the beautiful harmonies inside, and it reverberated, and they enjoyed the music of it. Uh, However, one day, this great adventurous mouse climbed way up into the top of the piano and found there sort of a mechanistic and mathematical way of explaining the noises that they heard, the harmonies and the beauty and the cohesiveness of the music itself. And he said, there are tightly strung strings at graduated lengths all across the piano. And so when it plays, there's these hammers that come down and that harmony is, comes forth and it reverberates within the piano itself. And so he climbs back down from the top of the piano and tells all of his little mouse friends that there is a mathematical and mechanistic way of explaining the beauty and the harmony. And so they think, well, we've got to reconfigure. We have to go back and redo the way we thought we knew everything. And so the unseen player, if you will, sort of became a myth in the culture that was inside that piano. And they said, well, this is how we can explain it. That there is hammers and strings and different harmonies are made from what is seen before us. You see, the problem with science is, in its essence, is is that it can explain the way the world works to some degree, uh, the way the universe coheses together. But what it cannot explain is why that it works together. I mean, have you ever been questioning yourself or questioning why did this happen? I mean, that's like the, the human existence at the beginning. The, the, a moment of consciousness, if you will, the four and five year olds, they begin and they ask the question, why? I can remember riding home with my neighbor's mother and the rest of the kids and I, it was my turn to sit in the front seat in her big old van on the way home from school. And I, and I just looked at her and I said, I wonder how radio waves work. You know, she's like, does it come across the sky and then how does it go into your TV and then make it into a picture? And she looks at me like, what is wrong with this kid? You know what I mean? She goes, I really have no idea, Scott. You know? What is it about us that want to know that there's something out there and how it works in the most essence of the beginning, the primal desire of life is why that it works? Why? I think that if we're going to look at the universe, we have to say that there is this beautiful harmony and movement in the natural world. Albert Einstein said it this way. He said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. And then he went on to say in that same statement, he said, because it is comprehensible, it is a miracle. It is a miracle. I think the argument is quite plain. How can you have a cohesive universe, laws of logic, laws of physics, laws of mathematics, without something that is not, uh, not only miraculous, but ordered and cohesive to give birth to something that is ordered and comprehensible and cohesive? Order does not come from disorder. A miracle requires a miracle worker. Otherwise, you have to have more faith to believe that there is a miracle with no miracle worker. I just don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I just don't. The truth is that the world of science depends on faith too. 
It is a religion of its own. How can you prove the existence of a primordial ooze that existed in space before time and everything else? How can you even have space for the ooze to sit in if there is no God that created it? It's not observable and you must believe it by faith. We all have faith. It's just a matter of what object that faith is in. Robert Gastro an astronomer and physicist who was the leading scientist at NASA during the Apollo lunar landing said it like this. For science, for the scientist who has lived by faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance and he's about to conquer the highest peak. And as he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been there for centuries. I mean, isn't that the truth? But as it is, listening to two atheists may be just like listening to two five-year-olds in infinite regress. Well, what caused that? Nothing. Well, what, who did that? No one. Well, where did that come from? Nowhere. It goes nowhere. First Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 15 in the NIV. Who is going to harm you, Peter says? If you are eager to do good, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. And believe me, they are threatening the Christian community and the world at large, especially those who believe in creationism. Do not be frightened. Verse 15. But in your hearts, revere Christ as God and always here it is. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for your hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Lord, bless your word. Drive it deep into our hearts, Lord. Illuminate it this morning by your Holy Spirit. We depend upon you, Holy Spirit, and all of our insufficiencies that you would transcend them and cause our hearts to change in Jesus' name. Peter says, don't be afraid of those who would intimidate you. Try, they try to bring fear upon you because you do not live and act like they do, or even more so, you do not believe like they do. We should walk around, uh, we should not walk around in fear of what man can do to us, but rather we should be confident in the blessings of the Lord. The world is increasingly beginning to threaten the church for its values and its voices against the sinful lifestyles of mankind. Yet we should not worry, be fearful, or intimidated, but rather be encouraged. For the fact that we are counted worthy enough to suffer for Jesus Christ. Um, Let me put it this way. Really kind of a funny story. Uh, I was a manager at Dairy Queen in Northern Kentucky University. I toured it, uh, not at the university, but while I was in school there, I helped manage a Dairy Queen just over the hill from the university. And I went to school, was an intern at the church, and a lot of things was going on. And one of those things that was a big stress factor to me was this one day I was at Dairy Queen, and one of the employees came and got me from the back and uh, said, this lady wants a banana split in a cup. You know, so you can eat it while you're driving, you know. <laughs> and I said, ma'am, we cannot make a banana split in a cup, and there's a reason for it. Because, you know, you put a, uh, the ice cream in there in this big old cup and all the fruit and the chocolate and the whipped cream and everything. And all your weights will get off, and we wind up giving you too much or too little. It's just better that we make it in that, you know, nice little banana boat. Now, after service, you can probably go get a banana split, right, as I talk about it. And so... I tried to explain it, but she got more mad as I explained it to her. And she was so angry that she's yelling at me in the middle of the lobby. A man even walked up from his booth and stopped what he was doing and came up to her and said, Ma'am, you just need to walk outside and calm down or something like that. I mean, just totally embarrassed herself. And and then finally, uh, she leaves the store without her banana split in the cup. And she had already paid and everything. And her friend walks in. She walks back and she says, I need to speak to you. And I said, uh, I said well, what, what do you need? And she began to explain to me that her husband was a lawyer and that uh, I publicly barraged her and uh, berated her amidst all these people and I have embarrassed her and everything and that she threatened me with a lawsuit. Now, keep in mind that in the, obviously it would have never happened, right? Uh, but uh, the reality of what I was experiencing at that moment is, is, oh, God, I'm going to be called the banana split bandit of Dairy Queen. <laughs> I'm going to lose my job. 
I'm going to get sued and I'm done, right? <laughs> my career is in it. Well, maybe that would be a good thing if my career ended as a Dairy Queen employee. But anyway, either way, I'm just, I'm just, what is going to happen? A few weeks later after the conversation, I made the banana split in the cup. I capitulated. I submitted to her whatever. Uh, gave her a nice free diet Pepsi or something like that. And she walked out. And here, all of a sudden, a few weeks later, I go out to get to the mail in the mailbox. And here's this lawyer envelope. You know. Johnson, Murphy, and somebody else uh, all on the envelope. And I think, I'm done. I'm done. This is it. This is the envelope. I wanted to open it so bad, but it was really mine to open. And uh, a few days later, the boss came to me and said, hey, you don't have to worry about that. That was from our lawyer. Right? <laughs> I was so afraid of what would have happened, even though I knew that I was right. And she was wrong. You see, the truth is, is that there is no judge on earth that can intimidate us because God is the ultimate judge. And we should not be afraid of what the world may do to us because our values and our voices and our beliefs, because we have a judge that is greater. He's above. He's beyond. Let me say it this way. Uh, Have you ever seen sequels to movies? I mean, there are some that are really good, but most of them are really bad, right? Crocodile Dundee. Everybody see Crocodile Dundee, right? Great first movie. This goes to, you know, New York. You got this guy from Australia. He's out in the bush. He's completely out of his element. Uh, You know, he pulls out his knife, and he says, that's not a knife. This is a knife, right? (laughs) He mugs the mugger, right? (laughs) And so... uh, so the whole story is, is really just brilliantly wrapped around that idea of this fish out of water, if you will. Well, the second one is the roles are reversed, and now the city folk are in, uh, 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 in Australia in the outback. Well, it's really, it was really bad, but there was one good part to it, I think, and that's where they're trying to find Crocodile Dundee out in all of his acreage in the, in the bush of the uh, uh, outback. And here is one of his uh, Crocodile Dundee's friends who's searching for him, and he's on his side, and he's sitting there to campfire and he's drinking you know a foster's beer or something like that and here comes the city folk coming in you know they could smell him because of his cologne they could smell him a mile away because he had cologne on and he's holding the big old rifle and he said buddy where's crocodile dundee you know he's, he's kind of he's mad he wants to find him and he says he's just sitting there by the fire kind of picking in the fire you know he says i'm not worried about it he says you you shouldn't have got a beer but you should have got a gun You know, out here of all by yourself. He says, I don't need a gun. I mean, just as calm as a cucumber. I don't need a gun. He says, I've got a donk. He goes, what? You've got a donk? What does that mean? And all of a sudden, this huge muscle-bound man appears from the woods behind him, grabs his gun out of his hand, snaps it in half, and knocks him out. You see, the truth is of your Christian lives is the fact that there is somebody that is greater who stands behind you. Do not be fearful. Do not be intimidated because there is a great and powerful God that is right behind you and He's got your back. Say to somebody, you got a... I got a dunk. (laughs) That might be sacrilegious to say that, but either way. You know... Uh, Whitney, my little one and a half year old, uh, I mean, there's nothing like her, uh, but she has two different screams. Everybody knows that has a parent, right? Or that is a parent, I guess. She has two different screams. The one scream is the whiny one and a half year old, you know, getting ready to enter the to- terrible twos. It elicits no response from Becca or I. Uh, I mean, just the, uh, nothing at all. You know what I mean? You hear her whine and you just think, well, that's just whining. But then there's another scream, and it's completely different. I mean, it's the hair-raising, blood-curdling type of scream. And, and, you know, it's like my finger is pinched in the door. I've scraped my knee. And, and one raises my blood pressure, and I have to, uh, my heart rate goes up, and I go running to wherever the scream is coming from. The other one, ah, it's nothing. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's two different styles. But this is the truth. C.S. Lewis said it like this. He says there's two responses of humankind. One is that you need to keep yourself safe. The second response is is that I'm walking by and I see a man drowning in a lake. And I feel compelled immediately to go save him. 
even if it's just to pick up a phone and call and say, hey, there's a man drowning in this water. He needs help. But most of us, I believe, even if you couldn't swim and even the fact that you know that you would put yourself in imminent harm, in danger, you would go after the man to try to save him at any measure. What in the world causes that if there is no God? Because the evolutionary concept itself speaks in the exact opposite. Preserve yourself. Keep yourself safe. And C.S. Lewis essentially says that it's not possible unless there is a God that you would have this impulse to do what is right and it's stronger than to keep yourself safe. Why did those men, when the Twin Towers fell, run into them instead of away from them? Why? At the Boston bombing marathon. Why? I said that backwards. The Boston marathon bombing. Why were there people, all of the pictures that I've ever seen, where people were running to others to help them and aid them instead of running for cover? This tells me that there is an innate moral law. A written code upon your heart and your conscience of every person that trumps your desire to preserve yourself and keep you safe. And there's this moral law inside of you that there must be a moral law giver. And if there is a moral law giver, there must be a God who is above and beyond all that is created and has put that moral law into each and every person's heart. Science cannot explain this phenomena. In fact, the survival of the fittest evolutionary concept says the exact opposite. Preserve the species, if you will. The weak die. And if that is true, then we really need to rid the planet of all doctors and hospitals. And uh, they're really messing up the evolutionary science, essentially. Dr. Kevorkian was probably the only person that got it right in that case. Why do you think that places like Stewart Home exist to care for those who are dedicated to intellectually less uh, uh, able than we are? Because there is something inside of each and every one of us that says their lives matter too. And that argument does not come from anywhere else except God. If there is value to human life, all human life, then it must come from somewhere. My proclamation to you is is that it is the image of God written onto each and every created human being. Because they're alive, they have value. And Peter writes, always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks to give you an account for the hope that is in you. Always be ready. Here, here's this, basically this eschatological thread, this end times thread. If Christianity is anything, it's an end times religion. God never promised perfection in this life. That's why you experience the hardship that you experience now. But only in the end is where he promises perfection. He promises the fact that this life will be hard, yet it will come to an end and there is better ahead of us. There are greater things. Perfection awaits us at the end. And all the injustices of this life can be made right if you have an eternity to do so. The verse is reminiscent of Peter's writings in chapter 1 of 1 Peter. Its metaphor is that we should gird up the loins of our mind, that we should always be ready is what he's saying. Now, in the uh, Greco-Roman world, if you will, and the Jews, they had these long flowing garments. Even men wore them from the top uh, to the bottom. And if you went to work or you had to go running or do something like that, you would grab the bottom of your garment and you would bring it up and you would tuck it into your belt. You would gird up the loins of your belt, basically, is what you were doing. And this is reminiscent of what happened in Egypt. If you remember at the Paschal Lamb, the Passover, the Jews were getting ready to leave Egypt and God said you need to eat because the Passover Lamb is going to happen. You sacrifice the Lamb, the blood is over the doorpost of your household and it will not harm you. That's the beauty of it, isn't it, right? That the blood of Jesus is over the doorpost of our hearts and we will not experience death like those who do not believe. And so what happens is, is that they're supposed to eat. 
with their garments gird up, brought up, and their loins girded about them, and they're supposed to eat with their staff in their ham, and er, ham, not their ham, they were eating lamb, not ham, and uh, their staff in their hand, and they were ready to leave Egypt. And this is the same exact idea that Peter is drawing on, that we as a Christian community are ready to be gathered together with Jesus. It's the reason that you're in this building today is because we are proleptically experiencing the fact that we will not only be gathered together as a Christian community in this place, but one day we will be gathered together in the skies to meet Jesus. And until Jesus comes, we will continue together on Sunday morning where we will experience, until we will experience the fullness of our resurrection and meet Jesus in the skies. So he says, be ready. Be ready to give an answer. At all times, somebody at some point in time, you know, I often think about it like this, you know, God tends to use people that are ready. Have you noticed that? People that are doing something, you know, when he called the disciples, we're going to talk about that tonight, when Jesus calls Peter and John and James when they're fishing, the fishing miracle. You won't want to miss that, I'm sure, uh, because maybe God will give you a miracle while you're fishing, okay? (laughs) No, that's not biblical. Anyway, uh, so the idea is is that, uh, you know, people are on the move. They're doing something, and God uses them. He uses people that are ready. He's like, uh, I mean, if you're doing nothing... And doing nothing to prepare yourself, why would God use you? I mean, that's just a, a good question, I think. And so God's using Peter and James and John, and he's pushing them towards their ultimate goal. And so he uses people that are prepared to give an answer for the faith that they have. And so we need to gird up our minds. We need to prepare ourselves to give an answer. Um, I think I don't want to say it like this. I had this friend in high school that we would often go over his house and we hung out in the basement. And uh, you walked through the unfinished part of his basement. There were ammo boxes and lots of guns and military rations and all that kind of stuff. And uh, today in contemporary uh, uh, kind of ideology, we call that those people preppers. You ever heard that before? Either he was in the CIA, which we can never really figure out, or he was a, um, some type of militia uh, resident or something like that. And uh, he actually had studded snow tires on his Lincoln. I couldn't figure that out. In the middle of summer, he's driving studded snow tires on his big old Lincoln. And uh, we call them preppers today, but the idea is, is that they're getting ready for some type of apocalypse. They're getting ready for the end, basically. Where things go into absolute chaos, and Scripture really speaks of this to a large degree. And the idea is, is this, that if we are ready to go be gathered together with the Lord, then we will be able to give an answer for our preparation, give an answer for what we are ready to do. Why do you live like this? Well, you don't know what my life was like before I met Jesus. There's a reason that I live how I do. Why do you say the things you say? Or why do you do the things you do? Why do you attend church? Because I'm preparing my heart for what is going to happen at the end of time. I'm getting prepared. Because I love Jesus. I live my life differently. And often the best apologetic, the best answer for your faith is your very own testimony. How God changed and transformed your life. He says, make it a defense. Some translations say, give an answer. The word used there in the Greek is apologia. It's where we derive the word in English, apologetics. Meaning, I will give you an answer. It has nothing to do with the word apologize. Rather, it has to do with the Greek meaning of giving an answer. Uh, Let me show you what I mean by this. Uh, Dr. Rutland, a great Pentecostal minister, uh, former uh, president of Southeastern University or Roberts University, and now he's a preacher uh, down there in the south of Atlanta. And so he's on a plane one day, and he's just exhausted from speaking, a long speaking schedule. And as he is uh, flying, there's this man sitting next to him, very well dressed, and uh, uh, he could tell he was probably a minister. Uh, and as the man uh, sits down, he says, well, uh, well, you know, what's your name? He's trying to chat with Dr. Rutland up, but Dr. Rutland, all he wanted to do was sleep. Anybody ever been on a plane before and just you don't want to talk sometimes, right? He was exhausted. Well, this guy's chatting him up. 
you know, uh, finally he comes to the point, well, he's Pentecostal, he's a spirit-filled believer, and yet this man is a Reformed uh, theology Baptist. And so they have a little bit of a clash in theology that's happening right there. And uh, this guy next to him, he's just, he, he's really frustrating, Dr. Rutland. And finally, at some point, he says, you know, this is the division between uh, the Reformed Baptist theology and the Pentecostal theology is essentially that God speaks right now today. Okay, and so the Baptist brother says, uh, you know, I just don't know where you Pentecostals get off saying that God speaks right now at this moment. He says God revealed everything within the scriptures and the scriptures are only God's word only towards mankind. And so Dr. Rutland, he didn't want to do this, he said, but he looks over at the man. And he says, well, what scripture is your name mentioned in that God called you into ministry? <laughs> God didn't say a word the rest of the flight. Because he realized that there was a dichotomy between his theology and what the Spirit actually was saying to him to call him into the ministry. There's a difference there. And so what Dr. Rutland was doing was just simply giving an apologetic. He was giving an answer for why the Spirit speaks today. Because all of us, each and every one of us, believe that the Spirit is speaking right at this very moment to each of our hearts. He was giving an answer, an apologetic, rationally questioning the man's belief. And so he gives an answer for the faith that he has in the Holy Spirit's working and speaking into our lives right at this moment. You see, the truth is, is just because a train doesn't run past your house doesn't mean that a train does not exist. Or Dr. Rutland puts it this way, the arrogance of making experience into theology trumped that trumps scripture is only expe- exceeded by making the lack of experience into theology that trumps scripture apologetics is a necessary necessary task um I believe as we speak to people, we speak to unbelievers, people that we desire to come to the Lord, that uh, we begin where they are and we move them towards this rational defense of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is ultimately so that we can lead them to Jesus, not win an argument. Even though sometimes it's fun to win an argument. uh, We have the ability to rationally and logically defend the gospel and that there is a God and God's existence itself. Let me show you what I mean by this. Uh, All knowledge is essentially a differentiation of something else. How do you know a cat from a dog? How do you know a dog's not a bird? You identify things by what they are or by what they are not. It's rational, right? It's logical uh, way of knowing things. It shows that there's an order to the universe. And something that uh, the uh, uh, modern world is warring against right at this moment. All of these issues that seem to some degree are peripheral to what's actually happening. Uh, uh, The world is trying to redefine the word gender, what gender is, right? Now, there's a fluidity now to gender, and they're warring it out in the courts of essentially what we're talking about here. That there is a division between what something is and what something is not. And so they want to make it fluid. Because if you can make gender fluid, then you can make all truth fluid. It just changes, you know, let me get back to what I was saying in this way. Have you ever wondered why communication is rational to begin with? I've been in five different countries in my lifetime, and uh, most of them, English was not the primary language. Uh, Most of it was Spanish, actually, or some type of tribal language, and Uh, All knowledge being a differentiation of something else uh, leads us to the fact that, well, why in the world was I able to communicate that there was something there that even in the most of the 50 states that I've experienced, I was able to communicate, even in Louisiana, I mean, South Louisiana, I was able to communicate. Uh, What is makes that cohesive and even possible that I can communicate to them? Why even in a foreign country where uh, we are totally different in nature and communication and language. Everything's different. We're still able to communicate the love of Jesus. It's because you're using a bridge that you did not build. The laws of logic, no one in the earth designed them, but everybody in the earth uses them. No one in the earth designed them, 
but everybody on the earth uses them. Otherwise, we would be locked in our own minds and unable to communicate. And the human race would go extinct because you could not convince your wife logically to marry you. <laughs> That's where I think it leads terminally. Some of you wives are thinking, I wasn't using logic when I married him. But uh, the truth is, is that there is this bridge that exists and it didn't come from us. It's the same reason that I cannot say God exists and God does not exist in both statements to be true at the same time. It's called the law of non-contradiction in logic. You can't say two statements that contradict each other and both be true at the same time. Why can we understand each other uh, as we communicate, uh, communicate with one another and something in the communication transcends culture and language? Where does knowledge itself come from? It must have come from somewhere. Otherwise, the universe itself would be absolute chaos. And if you want to argue with me that God does not exist, then we must use a cohesive order of the universe and the laws of logic before a single word can leave your lips. And if you're going to use them, then you're going to have to take the argument from God to use the argument against God. And it defeats itself. So someone may say, well, there's no such thing as truth. Remember, uh, uh, Pilate asked the question, what is truth, when he was talking to Jesus? Well, there is no truth at all. Well, the problem with that statement is is that it is a truth, truth statement in itself. There is no truth is a true statement. So if there is no truth, then that statement can't be true. It defies logic. It defeats itself. Someone will say, well, truth is relative, it's fluid, it's always changing. Well, does the truth that truth is always changing change right now? The argument defeats itself. It's refuting itself. Or truth is culturally bound. What truth in this culture may not be true in that culture. The problem is, is that that may only be true in that culture. You see the statements completely reverse on themselves and they don't make any sense. They defy logic and therefore are incomprehensible. This teaches us and leads us to the fact that there is one single universal truth. And if there is one single universal truth, then it must come from somewhere. And my argument is is that it comes from the loving creator and Jesus Christ himself. The statements refute themselves. There's laws, there's order, there's a cohesiveness to all of the universe. And this points us to one fact that there is a law giver, there's an order giver, and every piece of knowledge that you will ever know is pointing you to Jesus Christ. That's the terminal end of the argument that I just made. Every piece of knowledge that you have is pointing you to Jesus, pointing you to creator of the universe. Isaiah said it and Habakkuk restated it. Brother Ron, if you could come and play. Habakkuk 2.12, verse through 14. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by injustice. Has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labor is only fuel for the fire? That the nations exhaust themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The kingdom of God is coming from heaven to earth. And all of the fullness of the knowledge of God is coming here at this moment right now. And the longer that the earth exists, the more of the knowledge of God will flood the earth. We are here to open up the dams and the floodgates and the levees that hold back the knowledge of God to flood the earth. And by the end of time, all of the knowledge of God will begin to cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. But gentleness and reverence are the keys to helping people understand the gospel. If your conscience is clear amidst your conversations with one another, then your good behavior in Christ will not cause you shame. But it will actually reverse and cause those who revile you shame. Let me say it this way. We were in Florida. I was at a buddy's house that was just a block away from my house. And he was from Lakeland, Florida, so he knew rain better. I have this problem with trying to predict the weather. I'm usually wrong. And uh, so I bet him. I said, it's not going to rain. He's like, it's going to rain within 20 minutes. And I said, no, it's going to rain in one hour. 
You know, we're both pulling up the weather map on our phone and stuff like that. And uh, he said, nope, I can feel it. You know what I mean? Like, I can feel it. It's going to rain in a few minutes here. I said, no, I bet you. And we had a big outreach the next day and had a bunch of watermelons. He said, I'll eat a whole watermelon in one hour. If I'm right and if you're wrong, then you got to eat a watermelon within one hour. And uh, what he didn't know is, is that I picked the smallest watermelon I could find. I ate it. But what happened is, is that I, I no sooner than left his house and was walking up the street to mine, halfway up the block, I mean, it starts raining, like torrential downpour type of rain. You know, there's a certain amount of shame <laughs> linked with that whole story. I mean, I, I barely got out of the shop. They're probably laughing their heads off at me as I'm running through the rain, soaking wet. Every raindrop that hit my head was like a raindrop of shame. But this is the reality. If we don't gloat about it, it's not ours to gloat about it. It's not ours to uh, rejoice in it. The rain is coming. And for those who will not believe, it's the rain of shame. But for those who do believe, it's the rain of God's glory upon the earth. And all the fullness of the knowledge of God comes and wraps His joy about us. And He floods the earth with His knowledge of who He is in this great revelation. So if people will not listen to your argument or your testimony or your answer for why you believe, why you have faith, why you have hope, they're mean or they're nasty or they revile your good behavior, remember that the rains are coming. Joy for one, shame for the other. But all of us will be standing amidst the rains. We do not have the last word. It's not ours to gloat. But it is God who has the final say. All that I can pray is they experience the fullness of the mist and the beginnings of the rain. And they'll look up in the sky and say, it's going to rain. I need to repent. And somehow that that pain and shame would lead them to Jesus. I think that's what the Lord is saying. God's megaphone of pain. That if you just go out and do whatever your heart wills, your God, the scripture says, becomes your stomach. Whatever, you, whatever you, your appetite is at that moment, you go after it. That you will be found amidst the shame, drug addiction, whatever it is, a hardship that is lost in, in absolute and utter defilement, that one day you will look at yourself and say, this is not the life God created for me. That He's got a better plan. The best is yet to come at the end. Let me leave you with this one story. Pastor John Brevere, he's an evangelist, actually tells this story. And he said that he has a friend that pastors this very large church, about a church of 4,000 members. And he said that he started that church, I believe it was 1991, with 22 people in it. And the Lord just exploded them. It just grew and grew and grew. Powerful. But he said there was this older, distinguished, white-haired man that would sit a few pews back in the church and every Sunday morning he would just weep. I mean just weep. They built a bigger building. All this stuff was happening and uh, uh, so here they are. 4,000 people in this big massive church off the highway and this older distinguished man sitting there, white hair, business suit, looks good. Just weeping every Sunday. He approached uh, after one of the services one of the associate pastors and begin to tell his story of why he weeps every Sunday. He said that in 1989, the Lord called me to build a church in this city. And he said, the Lord showed me a building in my mind's eye. And he said it was absolutely so vivid that I actually went to an architect and had him design the papers, draw the building out. And here this man is sitting with this associate pastor and he opens up this article, or this uh, a document of an uh, artist's plans, opens up this paper and there is, in, in 1989 it's dated, there is the exact image of the church that they were sitting in at that moment. The same one. 
see, the truth is, is that God is going to accomplish His will whether you submit to it or not. I just don't want to be the person that sits in the pew every Sunday morning and weeps because I have not done what God has called me to do, what God has created me to do. He told the backstory, And He said, the Lord called me, I began to be obedient, and then it got difficult. And I just thought, I'm just going to go back to the business world. See, the truth is, is there are people in ministry that were called to business. And there are people in business that are called to ministry. And the only way that the fullness of who God created you to be is going to reach its potential is, is that you do what God has called you and created you to do. I just don't want to be caught at the end of times weeping. Do you remember Schindler's List? If you haven't read the book, then perhaps you've seen the movie. Liam Neeson is Schindler, and he develops this ruse to fool the Nazis to save all of these Jews. They're working in a munitions, munitions warehouse and making uh, uh, ammunition, but they never actually produce anything. He did a great job at fooling the Nazis and steal, stealing all these Jews to work in his factories. And at the end of the movie, you remember what happened. He walks outside of the warehouse when he gets news that the war is over and the Nazis have been defeated. They capitulated. That's over. And he walks out into the railroad tracks and he just begins to weep. <laughs> he just begins to weep. He takes off his rich watch and he says, This was two more Jews I could have saved. He takes off his ring and he holds it up and he says, There was one more Jew that I could have saved. I don't want to reach the end of the war of this world, spiritual against darkness and light, and to take off anything of my body or my life and say, Lord, I could have done more. I could have reached more. What God is calling us today is to reach the fullness of our potential in Christ. That we can change the world. God's not interested in saving the saved. I'm sorry to say that. He's interested in saving the lost. The sick need a doctor, not the well. You wonder why we do outreaches like we do and we don't have another meeting? Is because I care more about the lost than I do care about having another meeting. If I'm going to preach theology to you, then I'm going to go out there and do theology because there is a dichotomy between me if I don't do what I say. Why do we do outreach? Why do we go serve our community, clean up trash? And believe me, I went to the game farm a few days ago. It's disgusting. Because I want to serve the world and wash their feet and let them know the love of Jesus is real. I'm giving an apologetic as I reach down and pick up a trash bottle and put it in a bag. Isn't that powerful? Let's pray. Bow your heads, close your eyes. If there's a person in this building this morning that needs the love of Jesus in their heart, would you just raise your hand just as a confession of faith? I believe the Lord can save you right at the moment that you raise your hand. Isn't that powerful? <laughs> You raise your hand and say, Jesus, I need you in my heart. Boom. He does it. He's there. You don't have to repent and, and uh, come to a confessional box with me or anything like that. Your hand raised is a confession of your faith towards Jesus. And I believe at this moment, you're saved because of it. And Jesus, I just pray for us today. Lord God, that you would begin to prepare our hearts to give an answer for the faith that we have. Change us, O oh God. Touch our minds and our hearts that we can be ready for the coming reigns of Your Spirit, Lord. Renew us. Fill us, Lord God. Baptize us with Your Spirit, I pray. We ask this in the name of Jesus.